Today we're discussing English Apocalypse manuscripts. And so we're looking now at our map of Europe. Um, this was the part of the map that we used to help discuss um, pilgrimages to Santiago de Compostela and the various pilgrimage routes through Spain. We also had pilgrimage routes in England, but for the moment we're going to look at England and look um, at some manuscripts, so some books, some illustrated books that were produced in England in the 13th and 14th centuries, so at the end of the 1200s and during the 1300s. And this is all part of what we call Gothic art. Um, so Gothic art is kind of the last phase of medieval art um, after Romanesque art and through the Middle Ages. When we looked at Romanesque art, we talked a lot about drama, we talked a lot about narrative and stories and how those um, illustrations and sculptures and textiles liked to illustrate um, really dramatic stories um, and to engage in a lot of storytelling. And this is more true, even more true, of the Gothic period. Right now we're looking at a manuscript that we're calling the Gulbenkian Apocalypse. It's in the Gulbenkian Museum in Lisbon, in Portugal, and it was probably made in London during the 1260s. So this is the first page of the manuscript, um, which again is just a book. It's written on vellum or parchment, which is animal skin that has been uh, cleaned off, um, scraped, and dried under tension. And then instead of uh, being made into the leather by tanning, it is made into parchment by chalking it. So it's, so it's more white and more of a nice surface. So what we're looking at is the first page of the Gulbenkian Apocalypse. And um, we're looking at what we would call a half page miniature or uh, at the top of the page we see um, a decorated, a large historiated initial, um, which shows an angel talking to John, who is the author of the Apocalypse or the Book of Revelation, telling him that uh, what he should write in scripture. And then we have this rather elaborate pen flourish or marginal decoration, um, which involves a lot of gold. And then we have a peacock at the end here. In medieval, in the medieval world, animals had um, were symbols for different kinds of moral meanings, and they were used in stories to create different kinds of meanings. So, if you've ever uh, heard that a fox is deceptive or that um, elephants are afraid of mice, that all comes from a text called the Bestiary, which is a medieval book about animals. So in the Bestiary, there is an entry on the peacock, and the peacock um, is a prophetic animal, it says, because it has lots of extra eyes in its wings, and so with those extra eyes, it can see the future. So there you go. That is according to the medieval knowledge about peacocks. So if we look then at the image, let's see, we've got um, our half page framed miniature. We've got uh, a little bit of the story or the beginning of the story as to how the book of Revelation or which is also called the apocalypse came about. We've got John and John has been exiled to an island called Patmos and he's asleep on the island. Um, and you can see uh, we have like an aerial view of the island here. And then there are other little islands around it. Then we have a ship in the sea and other fish and sea animals, sea creatures kind of swimming around. Um, so we've got this kind of aerial view combined with a more typical kind of profile view of um, or frontal view of John and an angel comes to visit him in a dream. And so this is the story or the book of Revelation or the apocalypse is the story of John's dream where an angel takes him through uh, heaven. So this is also represented in a different way in this initial. We've got lots of gold here, gold leaf that's being used in this initial, and I apologize for the quality of the of the illustration here, but we've got again the angel telling John what to write, and John is writing on a little lectern in the way that we've seen um, in the form of author portraits before. Okay, and then we've got um, a detail of our peacock there. Okay.
So then once the angel takes John to heaven, um, we kind of turn the page and, and we see that John um, is asked to write seven letters to the churches in Asia. Um, and then he gets a vision of Christ and the seven candlesticks. The book of Revelation is a very visual book. Um, it's very visually exciting. And so that lends itself really well to illustration because what the illustrators has chosen to do here is to just literally represent many of the things that are represent that are discussed in the text. Um, and so that's kind of how we get uh, these are the angels to the seven churches in Asia. We've got John kneeling before Christ in the seven candlesticks, which is an episode in this particular story. And then the angel talking to John. Um, we get a lot of action, a lot of pointing and gesture here. That's part of how we tell the story. The angel pointing and John raising his hand is ref in reference to a conversation. Um, in this particular book, we have, there is the biblical text of Revelation, but there's also a commentary, um, a, a commentary that's probably from the 12th or 13th century that tells readers what the book is all about and how to interpret the text. There are a lot of unusual signs and symbols um, within the text, and the commentary helps to interpret the text. This is a very special illustrated apocalypse because not only are there illustrations for the biblical text there are also illustrations for the commentary text and one of the themes that we see running through this particular commentary in this particular book is a theme of anti-semitism or kind of an anti-jewishness um, which was a very common sentiment in the 13th century in england eventually jews all Jews would be expelled from England in 1290. And um, I've argued before that this particular book is used as propaganda for the expulsion of Jews. And if we look at this particular commentary illustration, which talks about um, how this, uh, how the text in Revelation symbolizes the fall of a personification of synagogue here. She's blindfolded, her spear is broken, she's dropping the two tablets of the Mosaic Law, she sits on a little hill, and she sits inside a structure with a dome, probably representing um, the ancient world or even the Romanesque world before, and she is contrasted with Ecclesia, who is a personification of church. Ecclesia is the church in Latin. And Ecclesia sits on a nice throne. Ecclesia carries what we would call the banner of the resurrection. And Ecclesia sits in a Gothic cathedral type structure surrounded by gold. She has a little um, lamb sitting on her shoulder. The lamb has a cruciform halo. Um, and in lots of the parts of the New Testament, the lamb symbolizes uh, Jesus Christ. Very bizarrely in these apocalypse manuscripts of this time, we often see an image of the lamb, Christ is the lamb, um, bleeding from a chest wound into a chalice, which represents the cup, uh, the communion or a sacramental cup. Um, so we've got a lot of strange imagery in these books, and that's part of the appeal of them. And then we have some Jewish elders in the middle trying to figure out whether or not they should lean towards a synagogue representing the structure of the Jewish church, or whether or not they should rep um, lean toward Ecclesia representing uh, Christianity in the 13th century. We know that they are Jewish because this figure here wears a hat with a little point on it, and that is the kind of hat that was worn by Jews in the Middle Ages. Uh, Jewish clothing was regulated by Christian documents and councils, and Jews were made to wear clothing that looked very different from the clothing that Christians wore, so that Christians would know that they were separate and other. It's also true that at this particular time, that Jews were also required to wear yellow stars on their clothing, much in the way that they were required to wear yellow stars in their clothing um, in Nazi Germany. Okay. So, um, if you know anything about the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse, um, we have a series of horsemen that appear that help to bring about destruction. And here is an image of John being shown the first horseman by the angel. So we get a sense of left to right storytelling. John is pointing towards the horseman. The angel is explaining. And here the angel has a scroll with some text on it that explains um, who this figure is, that this figure is the first horseman. And so there's a lots of ways in which text is integrated into these illustrations in a very um, 
comic book kind of way. Okay, this is the fourth of the horsemen. Um, sometimes we see John within the frame of the illustration. Here we see John outside of the frame of the illustration and kind of peeking in through a hole. The angel takes the form of an eagle here and tells John um, that this is the fourth horseman. The, fourth horse, the first horseman wasn't too scary, but by the time we get to the fourth one, they're pretty terrifying. So here we have a horse and his rider, who carries, if you will, a bowl or a chalice full of fire, he emerges from, this is a hellmouth. Um, you might have heard of hellmouths if you like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But this is, uh, in the Middle Ages, just as we saw in the Last Judgment Tympanum at San Lazar, literally hell is the mouth of a terrible beast with lots of eyes and lots of mouths. And there are flames emerging. There's a little devil here who's kind of boiling people alive. And if we look at some of the, in detail, at those who reside in hell, they include a bishop um, and other people. Because in the 13th century, one of the great concerns was that um, wayward priests or wayward bishops who were corrupt would lead people astray. So, And that's something that the commentary references in this particular book. So we've got um, some of these images and images of these um, groups who were thought to be causing lots of evil within the spaces of hell in this book. So we're not showing you all the illustrations here. There are 76 apocalypse illustrations and then about another 76 commentary illustrations, but we're just giving you the highlights. Um, what we see here in this next image is there is a pit of the abyss, and this structure represents the pit of, pit of the abyss. The pit of the abyss is unlocked. Here we see a key, and we see an angel who has blown a trumpet. There are seven angels with seven trumpets, in the book of Revelation, and each time a trumpet is blown, something really terrible happens. And at this particular trumpet, um, the locust beasts rise out of the pit of the abyss, and with them is their leader Abaddon, who is, which is a name for the the, the devil or Satan, and they trample um, the people of God. And so that's what we see. We've got this locust beast that has a human head and looks quite a lot like a horse with a serpent tail, um, trampling good people, and he is led by a king who has who wears a crown but who also wears this Jewish hat. In the Apocalypse text, it doesn't talk about Abaddon being a Jew, but the commentary text certainly um, infers that, and the illustration here takes it one step further. So we have here the devil represented as a kind of king of the Jews, and he's extra evil because he's got these terrible bat-like wings. Um, and so this is all part of John's kind of bizarre tour through heaven where he gets to see both terrible things that happen on earth and things that happen in real life. The next illustration that we're looking at is, um, I believe, a commentary illustration where we once more see Abaddon seated and with his legs crossed, showing that he's a king or somebody in a power of authority, still with a crown and the Jewish hat on, but his henchmen... And he's now got people kneeling to him, so he's kind of set himself up as a false prophet or as an antichrist, which is a theme of the commentary. And he is ordering the deaths of the two witnesses. So in the book of Revelation, there's a story where there are two witnesses, and they are killed in the holy city, and their bodies are left for three days, um, and they're killed by the bad guys, by, by like the enemies of God. And so this is, if you will, the text illustration but this is the commentary illustration. So we have within one image um, the sense of what is actually happening in the apocalyptic text and then how the way in which the commentary interprets these enemies of God and the leader of the locust species as Antichrist who sits in judgment and orders the death of the two witnesses. And so clearly we can see what a bad what a bad guy he is. Um, throughout this book, we have a lot of very fancy pen flourishes. These are effectively fancy doodles to help decorate the page. Gothic art is about narrative and storytelling, and I think that we can see that here. And drama, we've got lots of dramatic action, as this particular witness is both being run through with spears and about to have his head hacked off by this evil-looking figure. Um, but we also have a sense of the need for decoration. A lot of these pages have gold in them. We see lots of gold leaf. We also see lots of decorative borders. 
and then lots of additional figures that just help to create this sense of decoration, um, an additional sense of decoration. And, you know, if you've heard the, the design idea that maybe less is more, which is a fairly modern idea, um, in the Gothic period, we would really say that more is more. More decoration is always better. Okay. We then in the next illustration, we have an image um, of the dragon. This is a dragon uh, with seven heads chasing the woman in the sun who then has to hide her child in heaven and here the woman is interpreted as mary um, who's often shown in a fairly similar way at the nativity she hides her child who is identified as jesus with the cruciform halo and she hides him in heaven and then elsewhere in this image we see the altar in heaven or the space of heaven which is represented as a gothic cathedral you can imagine that if you saw lots of images in books of the space of heaven as being represented as a Gothic cathedral, that in actually entering a Gothic cathedral or a Gothic church that is decorated in this way, that you would associate that with the space of heaven. And so there are ways in which this book reaches out to the real world of the later Middle Ages to try and incorporate its symbolism in uh, meaningful and persuasive ways. Okay, this is um, one of uh, my favorite illustrations from this particular book. Later on in the book of Revelation, John and the angel encounter the whore of Babylon, um, who sits on the beast with seven heads. So the dragon with seven heads has a friend, the beast with seven heads, and the whore of Babylon, who is a personification of an evil city and really of just evil generally, um, we've got like the good woman, who's the woman in the sun of the previous illustration, and here's the bad woman of the apocalypse, the whore of Babylon, and she is tempting John with her um, with her wares and with her body, and here the angel um, is kind of showing John in this very awkward position, the whore of Babylon, and John is terrified. And so the angel kind of takes him by the hand and forcefully shows John what is happening. And that's all part of the drama of these scenes. It's not just that we get to see the horror of Babylon, but through John and through the representation of John, we get to see how we're, su we're supposed to respond to these scenes. And John responds not as a not always as a holy man, but as um, but as a person. And, um, and that's part of what art of the Middle Ages and the later Middle Ages is trying to do. It's to humanize uh, divine, divine figures. And St. John would certainly be one of those. And other versions, um, there are about 50 illustrated apocalypse manuscripts that survive from this kind of Gothic period in England. Um, and so this is just one example. All the images we're showing you today are from one book, but there are about 49 other books. And in some of these, John is really tempted to, um, tempted sexually by the whore of Babylon and is really attracted by her. And in other versions, he's so terrified of the whore of Babylon that literally he jumps into the arms of the angel. And so we get lots of very human responses from John. He's either horrified and terrified or he's enticed by the whore of Babylon. Um, it's all very human in its conception of some of these figures, which I think is very different from what we saw from early medieval art. Later on in the story, the whore of Babylon uh, burns. So literally the city of Babylon and the personification of the city of Babylon, they burn and then everybody in heaven rejoices that um, this enemy has been defeated. And so periodically within the story of the book of Revelation, we see these terrible things that happen on earth with Abaddon climbing out of the abyss, abyss. But then we also in the following illustration get a scene of what's going on in heaven with the court of heaven, where we often have an image of Christ enthroned with angels and the four apocalyptic beasts together with the 24 elders who accompany um, God in heaven. And so John is just very astounded by all of this as he kind of leans back on this hill. He sees what's happening, but he takes his cues from what's going on in heaven. And we see all these people blowing these different trumpets as uh, things begin to come to a close. We can also see the decorative elements that make up Gothic art uh, more of these pen flourishes. You notice that this little P that begins this paragraph has lots of these different doodles and designs. And that's part of the goal of Gothic art is to be really decorative and to embrace decorative elements 
in every way possible, as well as to tell stories and to tell stories with drama. Okay, this is one of the final scenes that we're going to look at today. Um, at the end of everything, if, if the apocalypse is a story about a kind of battle about John's vision, and this vision shows a kind of metaphorical battle between heaven and hell, eventually in the end all the bad guys are defeated. And we can see within this very complex multiple-mouthed hell mouth, we see the dragon with seven heads, we see the beast with seven heads, um, and we see another creature who represents uh, the false prophet. We see other people together with them in hell, and we see a demon kind of poking them with a bit of a fork while they're in hell. But what I love is this idea of hell as a monster, and that going to hell is to be consumed by this monster with horns. Um, and even in our, uh, in the image of um, tyranny in Ambrogio Lorenzetti's uh, allegory of bad government, we saw that tyranny had horns, and that horns are generally associated with evil and with evil things. And so this is a wonderful view of this, all the bad guys getting their comeuppance um, at the end of time. Okay, and here we have uh, the last image that we're going to look at today, or one of the last images we're going to look at today, is an image of judgment. So we might compare this to the uh, Romanesque uh, Last Judgment Tympanum that we saw at San Lazar. We have another image of Christ with his hands raised. He's sitting in this kind of special little quatrefoil space. And all of these people rise out of their graves. They're naked because they haven't yet um, moved on to the space of heaven. They've climbed out of their graves. And here the text says that they are judged from what is written in the books of life. And so we get these different pages from the books of life um, that are read. And so some people emerge from hell and others emerge from another space where they've been waiting to be judged. Here we see John kind of covering his face. I'm not quite sure if he's covering his face because of the nudity or he's covering his face because of fear of judgment. But he's off to the side and I think he's showing us that this, this act of judgment is quite fearful. Just as when we were looking at the Last Judgment in Tympanum, we saw that this whole process of judgment was quite fearful. It was, it was terrifying. It was meant to inspire fear. And then eventually, our last scene generally in the apocalypse is that we have the descent of the whole, the heavenly city. Um, and, and I always like, I like this one. I feel like the city is going to land with a thunk or a clunk on the earth. Um, and the angel explains that this is, if you will, the arrival of heaven on earth, this uh, event of the descent of the heavenly city where, and those who get to live in the heavenly city are those um, who are on God's side. And that's kind of how this is all explained. And so there is a kind of happy ending to the story. We get to see lots of the background decoration here, where it's not only the illustration of the city and the illustration of the angel and the illustration of John that are important, but also the articulation of a heavily decorated background, which helped to bring life to these particular Gothic scenes. Okay, so I guess going forward then, the discussion questions are like, what do you notice here? What looks interesting? And how do we make other kinds of connections between what we see in this book and what we've seen elsewhere in medieval art. Thank you very much.